The long campaign is finally over. In a few hours, we'll know what the people have to say about this bizarre election year of 1990. You're watching the news on Channel 4. It's 5 o'clock. Good afternoon and welcome to this Election Day edition of the 5 o'clock news. I'm Colleen Needles. And I'm Don Shelby. There are still three hours to go before the polls close, but all indications are that Minnesotans have something to say in this 1990 election. Tom Gasparoli is at a polling place in St. Paul to tell us about today's turnout. Tom? Well, Don, I'm here in Highland Park in St. Paul, and we do keep hearing that uh, turnout is heavier even than expected across the state, in line or higher than the 49 to 50 percent projected earlier this week. Well, turnout, as you can see here in St. Paul in Highland Park, is much higher than expected, much higher than that. There are 1,800 registered voters in this precinct, usually half or about 50 percent turnout to vote on Election Day. This year, as of 5 o'clock right now, there has already been more than 900 voters, and they expect several hundred more before 8 o'clock tonight. So we're talking about a 30% increase here. Election judges here say that is very surprising. Very much so. It far exceeded my expectation after reading the morning paper. What are people saying to you? Well, I think they are kind of fed up with the way the election, I mean, all the campaigning has gone, and it, uh, it's really angered them, and I think they're just anxious to make changes. Does that mean you think knocking incumbents out? Not necessarily. I wouldn't want to take a guess on that. Now, Highland Park is traditionally a DFL stronghold. Based on the people we've talked to today, that is holding true today. Uh, most people here seem to be leaning toward the Democratic side. And we talked to a lot of people about the negative campaigning, the sort of crazy campaign that we had this year, what kind of influence that may have had. So far, we've seen very few people say that had any influence. They seem to be going along party lines. So, Don, here at Highland Park, uh, the so-called anti-incumbency theme that we've heard about is also not playing a role as far as I can see. All right, Tom, thank you very much. We'll check back with you from time to time. Okay. Obviously, we don't have any election results as yet, but we do have an idea of what Minnesota voters are thinking today. Alan Cox is at our election desk in our newsroom. He has details on today's exit polling at selected precincts. Alan? Well, Don, Minnesota voters went to the polls today with an anti-incumbent mood. They feel better about the way the state's economy is going than they feel about the way the national economy is going. Those are some of the preliminary results from our exit poll, a questionnaire given to voters at sample precincts around Minnesota. Uh, they're still voting, so we're still counting the results. But here are some preliminary numbers about the mood of Minnesota voters today. In general, they're against incumbents. By almost a two-to-one margin, they'd rather see new faces in office than keep most office holders where they are. Now, once again, that's a general mood. It isn't reflective of an individual race. There's a mixed view of the economy. Nearly two-thirds of the voters believe Minnesota's economy is improving, but two-thirds also believe the U.S. economy is getting worse. Overall, the voters in our exit polls say the country's going in the wrong direction, but a majority of Minnesota voters believe President Bush is doing a good job. The most important issues to the voters making a choice in the Minnesota Senate race, the environment, the national economy, education, and federal taxes. And even though this election isn't over, we're already looking four years ahead. On the question of Dave Durenberger's future, only a third of the voters want him to run again. The rest want him not to run or even to quit now. Our exit poll is conducted by Voter Research and Surveys. That's a cooperative of CBS News along with ABC, NBC, and the Cable News Network. And Don will be getting updated figures as the night goes on. All right, Alan, thank you very much. For the candidates, this has been a day for last-minute handshaking. Governor Rudy... Long lines all day long. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that maybe the controversial controversies around, um, you know, the governor's race or any of the other races? I think the controversy, I also think the negativism of the campaign contributed a lot to the turnout today. Mm -hmm. And what about you all? You will be here until the, the late hours. Don't expect to leave until at least midnight. It'll be a late count. Mm -hmm. And what about the write-in campaign? You didn't have to really worry about that with uh, Arnie Carlson and Deerstad. But what about the other ones? You mean the Grunset? Mm -hmm. They will be counted as write-in type votes. Okay. All right. mm -hmm. Thank you. Marjorie Rudy, who is the precinct chairperson. We also wanted to mention that this is the first time that the campaign ads will be running, so maybe people who have not voted already will get a chance to vote by this evening. Back to you, Dave.
Lots more to cover on tonight's 6 o'clock news. Minneapolis police break up what they call a major sports bookmaking ring. Mark Rosen will report an agreement between DJ Dozier and the Minnesota Vikings and explain just how close the Vikings might be to a wild card berth if all continues to go well. Next, Mike Airborne will tell us why it's going to get colder before it gets any warmer this week. This is the 6 o'clock news on Channel 4. Cruising, I feel, is something that a lot of people dream about. Somewhere is here on a princess cruise. Somewhere between a wave and the sea, between a glance and a touch. Somewhere, Somewhere only on princess. It's more than a cruise. It's the love boats. Hot NHL action is skating your way tonight as the Chicago Blackhawks battle the Hartford Whalers live from the Hartford Coliseum, exclusively on Midwest Sports Channel. Help support Minneapolis Children's Medical Center and join WCCO-TV for our third annual A Red Ribbon Affair. Hi, I'm Don Shelby. And I'm Mark Rosen. Invest in the special needs of children while enjoying an evening of gourmet food, live entertainment, and much more at the conservatory. Participating stores will donate 10% of all purchases made that day to Minneapolis Children's Medical Center. A Red Ribbon Affair, Thursday, November 29th. For ticket information, call 863-6621. Joyce. Choice. 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 For the past year, Cheer. Jim Reby has volunteered one Cheer. to two nights a week teaching English as a second Cheer. language to people Cheer. who have a desire to learn English. WCCO-TV and Time to Share salute Jim Reby as Volunteer of the Month. With the help Jane. that Jim offers, his students are better able to cope with everyday life in our society. Thank you, Jim Reby, for taking the time to share. If you would like to volunteer, call 227-3938 for more information. This is the scene today in Columbia Heights. Voter turnout there is said to be heavy. It appears to be the chill, that the chilly morning did not keep voters away. Now, Mike Fairborn and the weather. On the other hand, it wasn't all that chilly. <laughs> Brisk I don't know, would I don't, be a I don't know word. that the temperatures really keep people away yeah. as much no, as maybe it, snow and right. rain and that kind of thing. But uh, one of the chilliest election days out of the last 10 mm. here in the Twin Cities is only 39 degrees was our high temperature. That's uh, oh. a little unusual, I guess, when you stop and think about it. But, hey, the ducks were enjoying it. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah. had 39 today. Uh, 24 was the early morning low and no precipitation. And that was quite a luck out for us because not too far to the south as much as three inches of snow across the southern tier of counties in Minnesota and as much as five inches of snow down in parts of Iowa and out through Nebraska up to a foot. Mm. Temperature right now 35 degrees, uh, humidity 54 percent, the barometer is on the rise. We have a northwest wind out there. Here's what the uh, temperatures, well let me show you our temperatures before I show you the national temperatures first. Here's what our temperatures are doing already down to 19 degrees in War Road, uh, 20s up to the north of us, uh, warming through the 30s throughout the daytime hours. We're going to clear off, and our temperature is going to drop rather sharply when that happens. In fact, it's clearing out there right now, and our temperatures will probably end up in the teens before morning. So it'll be a nice, chilly start to a sunny day tomorrow. Wasn't sunny today. Clouds streaming across the southern part of the state, and down here to the south where these clouds were moving all day long, just nice, steady snowfall all the way from Nebraska across the southern counties, as we said, and down into Iowa as well. Fairly close to the clearing line. And as that happens, well, here's where all the snow fell. Ooh, a little jitter and flutter in there, too. Three to five inches of snow across Nebraska and Iowa and up into uh, parts of southern Wisconsin. Let's see, get rid of that one. Okay, make you all nervous out there. Here's the little weather system that moved through us uh, today, and that's going to pass on to the east. High pressure building in. We'll uh, clear the clouds out, give us some sunshine tomorrow. It'll be chilly but it'll feel warmer with the sun out rather than the gray overcast we've had the last couple of days. High temperatures will only be in the 30s, though. We are looking at a warm-up headed to our direction for the weekend, but it looks like it's going to take it a couple of days before we see 40s again. Here's our uh, forecast for tonight. Clear and cold, 17 by early morning with northwest winds at 5 to 15 miles an hour. For tomorrow, mostly sunny but chilly, 37 degrees for a high temperature, about like today, north to northwest winds at uh, 10 to 15 miles an hour. Tomorrow night, mostly clear, 22, not as cold as tonight. And then for Thursday, increasing clouds, breezy, turning warmer, 
47. That'll feel comfortable to us, I think, after the chilly spell we've had. The extended outlook, next chance of any precipitation is on Saturday. Looks like our high temperatures will hold in the 40s for the next few days and then cool off again toward the end of the weekend. And here are the answers to our Soil Forever contest. And the question was three soil particles, and it is clay, silt, and sand. Of course. Uh, we'll repeat that at 10. Okay, very good. Thanks. Uh -huh. And we will be back with more of the day's news. There was some, believe me. First, this reminder to vote if you haven't already done so. Here is a number to call if you need help. Full tank of gas and cold fried chicken. What more could you ask for in a road trip? Now that's Tony O, engineer extraordinaire. That's me, Hank, ditto. And that's Bill, marketing maniac. It was 1985. We were designing a transmission for the new Saturn, but the rest of the car wasn't finished yet, so we borrowed another car and put our transmission in it. We said it would run like a dream no matter who was driving or where. Marketing said, prove it. So we drove and drove. Here we are achieving optimum shift stability with minimum torque disturbance. It's going uphill real fast with the AC blasting. Calls crazy. Regular fuel stops, a little sleep, 15 more road trips, and more than 6 million miles later, we had some good information and truly unique personal mementos. Our Saturn transmission came through with flying colors. Wish we could say the same for Bill. Marketing will never doubt us again. Bounty means never having to say, I'm sorry. So sorry. Even for the worst bills. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Bounty's quicker and thicker than any other national two-ply paper towel. Quality tools and building materials than none. Your shop or garage warm with the Ready Heater 50,000 BTU Heater. Now $149.99. 3M Safest Tripper Paint and Varnish Remover. No harmful fumes or odors. $12.99 a gallon at Knox. We've got everything you need to do the job right. Knox, the Project Center. I'm Amy Marsalis at IR headquarters. Tonight in our election coverage, we'll focus on the race for the U.S. Senate, the 3rd District Congressional Race, and the race for the Hennepin County Attorney's Seat. I'm Mike Walter at DFL headquarters in downtown Minneapolis, where later tonight we'll learn whether Rudy Perpich returns for four more years as governor and whether Paul Wellstone can ride an anti-incumbent feeling into the U.S. Senate. Hi, I'm Bill Hudson at the Arnie Carlson headquarters at the downtown Hyatt. Join us tonight for up-to-the-minute election results. An exclusive interview with Gruntsip in Maui tonight at 10 on Channel 4. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, the polls have just now closed in the state of Minnesota, and it is time to begin looking into the results of the election as they begin to trickle in. And they are doing just that, trickling in, because as you know, because of the confusion in, in the election this year, uh, a lot of the work is on paper ballots, and the governor's race will have to be hand-counted, so that's going very slowly. That's going to take uh, much of the early evening and getting any results in, but first we're going to go to Alan Cox, who has been monitoring our exit poll results. Alan, what can you tell us so far? Well, Colleen, the uh, exit poll is showing that the races are close enough that they uh, are not calling either of the races. If one of the statewide candidates, either in the Senate race or the governor's race, were out far enough in advance from the exit poll, the questionnaire given to voters around the state as they left the voting booth today, uh, we would have a projection from uh, voter research and surveys. That's the organization that's uh, putting together the uh, exit poll and the projections of winners. But at this point, in neither the governor's race nor the senator's race is there one. Here's an indication of one of the ways that the governor's race is running so close tonight. On the question of abortion, abortion opponents are uh, voting for Rudy Perpich. Abortion uh, supporters are voting heavily for Arnie Carlson. Most people voting today say they favor some restrictions on abortion, and they're dividing about equally between the two candidates. On the question of uh, people's political persuasion, liberals are voting in favor of Rudy Perpich, conservatives by a two-to-one margin in favor of Arnie Carlson, and once again, moderate voters uh, who make up the vast uh, middle of the electorate, about half the voters today, they are splitting about equally between the two candidates. 
Uh, Arnie Carlson is doing well among women, among upper income groups, and uh, among uh, uh, conservative and college graduates. Uh, Rudy Perpich doing well among union members, DFLers, and uh, other groups that traditionally fall in behind the Democrats. We'll have some more figures on the Senate race, and uh, we keep monitoring to see if a projection uh, occurs from the figures we have so far. Colleen, Don? Alan, can you tell us how many people are actually polled in these exit polls? At this point, uh, there are a little over a thousand people questioned. Uh, by the time the night is over, they will have questioned uh, more than 1,300 people in the state of Minnesota. And if the exit poll remains close, they'll be waiting for the uh, sample precincts to actually report their vote count. And because of the plethora of ballots we're facing in Minnesota tonight, that could be a little later than usual. So uh, this uh, computer here tells us a lot of things, but it may not uh, end the evening as early as uh, it would otherwise. Okay. Thank you, Ellen. We're going out to Mike Walsher now, standing by at DFL headquarters, uh, where he is sampling the reaction there to... Uh, what has to be a surprisingly large voter turnout that people are hearing about. Well, it certainly has been, Donna Colleen, and the mood here, the emotion here is mixed. People who are supporting uh, Perpich and Wellstone, these solid DFL supporters, uh, they don't quite know what to make out of the results and, and the exit polling that they're hearing about. They're very excited about Paul Wellstone's chances. They are not happy about what's happening with Governor Perpich. Perpich's people, John Stanek and Roberta Heine, are here at the Holiday Inn. The governor is still at the governor's mansion. Uh, Heine and Stanek are upstairs. They are, I am told, talking to northern Minnesota precincts, trying to find some semblance or some some hope there some big turnout in the northern part of the state that might turn around and and might allow them to squeak through a victory they're very concerned about ticket splitting in the twin cities and in the suburbs they believe that many people in the twin cities turned out to vote for paul wellstone but also split their tickets and voted for arnie carlson so there's a great deal of concern about uh Perpich's chances but a great deal of optimism about the wellstone campaign here Mike, when you talk about being uh, the people there being buoyed by the uh, figures that they're hearing at headquarters about Wellstone's performance uh, tonight, uh, the last poll that was uh, uh, out in the field indicated a nine percentage point lead by Boschwitz, but what are they hearing there at headquarters that makes them feel so good? Well, they're, uh, they're hearing that Wellstone is maintaining a uh somewhat of a lead in exit polling, the results that they're getting from various sources and their own internal polls, and it's also just their own feelings. They had people out door knocking all afternoon in the cold weather. They had a good turnout of students uh, around the Twin Cities and also in some college towns like Mankato and Duluth and Moorhead, and they're just feeling uh, very confident that Wellstone will pull through, but not quite as confident about the governor. All right. Well, thank you, Mike. And on that note, we're going to go now to the governor's mansion where Tom Gasparoli is standing by. Tom, what can you tell us about the mood there at this point this evening? Well, we're outside, Colleen, as you can see. We can't tell you too much about the mood inside. We can tell you that uh, Governor Perpich and Lola did vote up on the Iron Range today, as they always do. And typically they come back here to the Twin Cities late afternoon, early evening. That's exactly what they did today. Uh, we have some pictures of Lola and the governor driving in a little before 7 o'clock. Um, there's Lola, who came in by herself about quarter of seven, said she didn't know where the governor was. And then moments later, he drove in. As you can see there, we waved and, and uh, yelled a question or two, and he didn't stop, as you can see. He went on right in there through the gates and went inside. Um, the news here at the governor's mansion tonight is, uh, is that the governor has left. He stayed here about a half an hour, and then he and Lola drove out the back door. We're not sure where they are at this hour. We spoke to someone on the staff here at the mansion and they said the governor on his way out said it's going to be a long long night he expects the race to be very very close so he's going out for a while again we do not know where he is if it looks like he's losing he's not expected to make a public appearance here in the twin cities he may go back up north if it looks like he's winning he may go downtown to dfl headquarters later on tonight so right now uh, another uh, an air of mystery out here at the mansion uh, the governor is somewhere here watching the returns Okay. All right, thank you. Thanks. Now, it might not be a bad idea for people to uh, take a sort of a hint from the governor who may be finding a way to get some sleep between the close of business uh, tonight and early tomorrow morning because it may be until 6 o'clock tomorrow morning before those final results are in on the governor's race. And because of that, we've scheduled our own program at 6 o'clock. Colleen and I will be back to uh, anchor that with the rest of the CCO News staff. So if uh, you choose to go to sleep at your normal hour, 
Uh, please tune back in at 6 o'clock in the morning for the uh, final results on the election. In fact, all the results couldn't be coming in very late because many of the precincts say they're not releasing any results until they get those separate governor ballots counted by hand. So it's all going to hinge on how long it takes those to be counted. Right now, we're going to go, though, to the other candidate for governor's headquarters, Arnie Carlson, where Bill Hudson is standing by. Bill. Well, Colleen, the crowd uh, hasn't arrived yet, but certainly the candidates have. Arnie Carlson and his wife Susan arrived about 45 minutes ago. We just left them. We interrupt you just for a minute, uh, Bill. We've lost your video signal. Uh, we're going to try to get that straightened out, but we're going to go, uh, before we go on any further, we want to go to our veteran political correspondent, Pat Kessler, who's standing by with us to discuss some of the exit polling and some of the trends that uh, seem to be developing here tonight. Very, very, very story. interesting. It's the end of a campaign that was certainly the most tumultuous in modern Minnesota times. It was a campaign that destroyed one candidate, resurrected another candidate, gave new life to a vulnerable governor, and it was a campaign that saw an unknown college professor mount an unexpectedly tough challenge to a savvy Washington insider. Here to help us talk about this is Carleton College professor Stephen Shear, who is a, not affiliated with any campaign, nor is he a member of a, either political party. He's a nationally recognized expert on American politics, and Steve, we're very glad you're here tonight. Perhaps turbulence or tumultuous is the wrong word. Perhaps uh, dirty and negative is a better word. What about it? Well, I think this is the uh, it, this has seen a number of very negative events. This campaign, it's been uh, one of the dirtiest, I think, in recent Minnesota memory, and I think it'll go down in history, and, uh, leaving a bad taste in the voters' mouths in some ways. Well, let me stop you right there. What is the difference between dirty and negative? Let, let, let me give you a couple examples. We have what about uh, Boschwitz going around with the commercial saying that Wellstone wants to end Medicare? Dirty that's, negative. What that's is it? negative. It's negative because it's an interpretation of a particular uh, position that Paul Wellstone had taken. Uh, it's uh, negative uh, but fair. Well, it's uh, it's within the realm of of remote plausibility, and that makes it uh, negative without being extremely dirty. A dirty comment is something that is truly extraneous to the campaign that does not uh, really enlighten us in an important way about a candidate's character or his or her positions. And I wouldn't ca classify that particular charge as dirty. Well, uh, what about the uh, Boschwitz letter, uh, I'm a better Jew than you, uh, letter with Wellstone? That's dirty. It does not, uh, it does not illuminate uh, the candidate's character in an important way that is necessary for the voters to know. And in fact, I think it's remarkably counterproductive for the Boschwitz campaign to make such a statement. Okay, let's go over to the governor's race, where, of course, uh, much of the uh, turmoil occurred during the last month. Uh, Governor Purpich going around the state with John Grunseth's divorce papers. Dirty or negative? Both. That is both dirty and negative. It's dirty in the sense that it is a gross distortion of uh, a very tense personal time for John Grunseth, and it really overstates the nature of that divorce uh, controversy. And sec but on the other hand, it was effectively negative, and I think it had a role to play in making, uh, putting Rudy Perpich ahead of John Grunseth in the polls. It became a, a lunch table conversation about John Grunseth. Sure. Okay. One more then uh, on the allegations of sexual misconduct against Grunseth. How do you characterize those? Well, I consider that to be fair game for the media and for the public because it is a legitimate character issue when a candidate for the highest executive office in the state is possibly engaged in sexual harassment. Okay. We've got all of this, these charges flying during the last four weeks of the campaign. It was an exciting campaign, interesting to watch, but did it propel voters to the polls? I think it did in the way that uh, an elaborate uh, football game or uh, mud wrestling match did. Uh, <laughs> I think people really picked uh, sides on this one, and I think they're turning out to say who they think uh, had the right uh, had the right position uh, in the middle of this mess. So they didn't put them in a, in a hammer lock or a sleeper hold or anything like that? Well, I think there were attempts, but it was uh, a very slippery and unpredictable and volatile time. Yeah. Uh, Steve, I have a quick question. We've heard uh, reports that there's good, there is a very high voter turnout, higher than expected. Who's likely to benefit from that? Well, you know? usually when you get a high voter turnout, you're getting more independence. People with uh, low motivation and low uh, information about the election compared to uh, partisan identifiers. That would seem to help Republicans, uh, but it depends how independents are voting tonight. Uh, the Republicans need that independent vote in order to catch up with the stronger DFL base. Okay, Steve, thanks very much. Uh, Don, Colleen, we're going to be with Steve all night long and um, hope to have an awful lot more for you. Good. Yeah. We're going now to uh, Alan Cox, who is standing by with more information on that uh, exit poll. Alan. Uh, Don, uh, still no uh, projection of a, a winner in either of our statewide races. The Senate race at this point apparently too close to call. That's based on the exit poll, a questioning of more than 1,000 voters as they left uh, sample precincts around Minnesota. 
Here's uh, one of the indications of how close this race is. You would expect Paul Wellstone to lead heavily among DFLers. You'd expect Rudy Boschowitz to lead among independent Republicans. But among independent voters in Minnesota, the ones who often swing an election, the uh, results are very close. As a matter of fact, uh, our margin of error, uh, because of the size of the sample, is four percentage points. So for all intents and purposes, the two Senate candidates running even among the people who'd answered the exit poll by late afternoon. And on the uh, division of liberals and conservatives, those are two groups that are about the same size in Minnesota. Wellstone taking the liberal vote, Rudy Boschwitz taking the conservative, no surprise there. The moderates may decide that election. 50% of the people voting today say they are moderates. And in that case, the two candidates are uh, once again too close together to, to tell which way the pattern is going. Rudy Boschwitz doing well today with middle-aged voters, with uh, conservatives, with people who say they believe the direction of the nation as a whole is going right. Paul Wellstone doing well with young voters, labor voters, liberal voters, and voters who say they are worried about the uh, track of the nation's economy. So once again, uh, still waiting to see. Uh, no, no projection for you yet, so we're going to be here a while longer, Don and Colleen. Alan, how do people uh, in the polling business who conduct these exit polls select the polls that will give them the best results, the most accurate results when they go back and check them later? Uh, they uh, take a random sample of precincts around the state. In this case, they took 30 precincts, uh, large, small, northern, southern, metro, uh, greater Minnesota. And uh, based on voting patterns of the past 20 years uh, with computer analysis, they're able to make some judgments about what the final vote totals will be. But once again, at this point, we're not near making that judgment in the Senate or in the governor's race in Minnesota. Okay. Well, thank you, Alan. Right now, we're going to go out to Cindy Hiltzer, who is standing by at the IR headquarters. Cindy. Don and Colleen, we are at the Thunderbird Motel out on the 494 Strip in Bloomington, where the party is just getting underway. We just had a polka band wrap up. We've got a few people trickling in here. Joining me right now to talk about uh, what's happening in the Senate race is Jay Novak. He is the communications director for the Rudy Boschwitz campaign. Mm -hmm. And Jay, what we're hearing right now is this race is so close, too close to call. Um, are you, would your numbers corroborate that? We uh, didn't do any exit polling uh, t today, and so we really don't have any numbers. Uh, intuitively, we, we believe that it's, uh, it's very close. We have heard, uh, heard a few numbers, but uh, they have been come to a second and third hand, and they've been inconsistent, so I, I really don't know any more than that. Over the weekend, Senator Bosch was had about a nine-point lead in both the Minnesota and the North Star polls. Um, what may have happened to that lead if the race right now is this close? Well, those, uh, the polls all year have been very volatile, and you know that uh, on October 18th, we had about an 18-point lead, and eight days later, we had about a three-point lead. And we don't know if there's a problem with the polling or if there's just uh, a lot of... Um, a lot of uh, emotion this year that's causing people to, to change their mind. Speaking of that, we know there is a very high voter turnout. How might that affect um, the, the senator's chances tonight? We, we really don't know. Uh, it, it just depends on where the, the high turnout is. If it's in areas of, uh, of, of strength for Senator Boschwitz, it's all to the good. If it's in uh, areas where uh, the Democrats tend to prevail, uh, it could mean something else. Have you been with him this evening, and can you tell me what kind of mood he's in right now? I have not been with him. I spoke to him on the phone at uh, about 4.30, and he was, uh, he was feeling good, I think. At what point might we see him here this evening? I believe he's probably in the building, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure of that. He had dinner at about 6.30 or 7 o'clock. It was about to head over. So I, I think when you'll see him will depend on, on uh, how things are going. All right, Jay Novak, thank you very much for joining us. Don and Colleen, we're going to go back to you. A little bit subdued. Yes, you'd you say, say somber. Uh, I suppose that is uh, is something that would be common when an incumbent, an unpopular incumbent, up until just uh, a few weeks ago, uh, faces even a close race, let alone a, a one that uh, might find him losing his position. So I think that that has them very frightened at uh, Boschwitz headquarters, and that, that's an unusual situation for, of course, any, any uh, incumbent to be in at this point in time. Whether but apparently that's sweeping the country, as our experts have told us all along. Whether it's somber or cautious, we're not sure at this we'll point. Find out. But we're going to go out right now to DFL headquarters where Amy Marcellus is standing by. What is the mood there? Well, it's not very subdued at this point. Now, they're not cheering yet, but the enthusiasm is building here at DFL headquarters at the Holiday Inn downtown. I'm with John Blackshaw with the Wellstone campaign. He had dinner with Paul about an hour ago. What is his mood, and, and what are you thinking of the exit polls you've seen so far? Well, Paul's very upbeat, uh, and he's a bit nervous, uh, understandably so. But the, uh, we feel very encouraged, and uh, the exit polls and everything we've heard that we're doing uh, well. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're been using the word, we're cautiously optimistic at this point. 
what do you think has been or what was the turning point for the Wellstone campaign? Well, it's hard to pinpoint anything that's been a turning point. Um, what I really think has happened in this race is that Paul Wellstone has been able to withstand and stand tall to a series of negative ta attacks, uh, and they got very personal. Would you cite the, the Boschwitz letter uh, with the Jewish issue as, as one of those particular instances? Well, certainly it was uh, one of the worst attacks that uh, Boschwitz threw at, against us, and I truly believe that that probably was the straw that broke the camel's back. Do you think that got Wellstone a lot more voter, a lot more votes? Well, it's hard to measure whether it got a lot more voters, but I think what it did was it allowed people to finally realize that what this man has been saying about Paul Wellstone is completely untrue. When are we going to see Paul tonight? Um, Paul will probably be down a um, little later in the evening. You're not going to give us any specific no, time here, be real general? Not at this time. All right. So you're feeling very upbeat at this point? Well, uh, you know, I think we're feeling pretty good. Um, okay. You know, and there's a long way to go. The votes still have to be counted. But um, everything that we've heard so far is, is pretty good. All right. John Blackshaw with the Wellstone, well, Wellstone campaign. We'll be checking back with you throughout the evening. Back to you, Donna Colleen. All right. Thank you, Amy. Mm -hmm. Just a comparison right there between the, uh, the two campaign leaders from one side and the other. A little bit more upbeat in the Wellstone area. A little but still bit more cautious. Subdued. I mean, I think everybody's <laughs> a little nervous this evening. Well, I think from the exit poll, that's pretty clear so. why. That, uh, it's basically a tie at this point. You know, after months and months of work, it all comes down to this night, and this is what everybody's been working for. One of the people who um, is doing well in the exit polling is Arnie Carlson, and Bill Hudson is standing by at uh, Carlson headquarters. And, uh, Bill, we have your signal loud and clear. I hope you've got us this time, Don. Yes, we, we, just, do. uh, we just left Arnie Carlson about 30 minutes ago at his dinner table. Uh, both he and Jonelle Deerstead are here dining separately with just their closest family and friends. Uh, he said he'd be up here in about 45 minutes or so if we had some good news for him. Uh, but he uh, appeared rather upbeat. He was uh, joking around with his uh, 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 dinner guests. And uh, uh, one thing that uh, they told us is that uh, earlier today he was very, very uptight. He was very nervous. Uh, he was about as tight as a fiddle string, they said. Uh, however, this afternoon he got over that by going to a movie. They didn't say what movie he went to, but uh, he has been able to relax, and uh, he appears... Uh, uh, very, very relaxed tonight. So we're hoping to see him in about a uh, oh, half hour or so. Uh, one thing that they're going to be watching for, however, are the results that come in from, uh, from the metropolitan areas. They need to do very well here in the metropolitan areas to offset uh, the expected uh, uh, huge vote totals that Governor Perpich will uh, ring in from the Iron Range. So be watching for that uh, as we get some results in from the metropolitan areas. Don? All right, Bill. Thank you very much. You bet. Well, we don't have any results locally or statewide to bring to you, but we do have some results coming in from across the country in different races around the nation, and recapping that for us is Dave Moore, who has been monitoring those all along. Dave, what can you tell us what's happening elsewhere? Well, I, uh, I can tell you one thing, the uh, throw the rascals out of the anti-incumbency uh, fever that would, was thought to have taken over the country is not working, at least in the House of Representatives, we discovered so far that at least 90% of House of Representative incumbents uh, have been reelected. Uh, not surprising in view of the fact that 85 of those incumbents have run without major uh, opposition. Two re uh, incumbent Republican governors already uh, have been uh, tossed out. Uh, Bob Martinez, the Republican down in Florida, has been defeated by the former U.S. Senator Lawton Childs. In Kansas, Joan Finney, a Democrat, has unseated the Republican incumbent Mike Hayden. Mike Hayden has been very closely associated with rising property taxes. So that appears to have been his undoing. In Connecticut, here's a name out of the past, Lowell Weicker who made a name for himself on the Nixon impeachment committee many, many years ago, it seems like about 400 years ago, has run for and won the seat as an independent candidate for governor uh, in Connecticut. Uh, so we have three gubernatorial races. Interestingly enough, no one, the wires nor anyone, has called the uh, Helms-Gantt race for the Senate in North Carolina. Here's a, uh, an overview of the governor's races you see on your screen now. Uh, polls have closed in 29 of the states. Uh, 36 gubernatorial seats are up for grabs. Uh, the Democrats have captured 12 of them, uh, two by Lawton Childs in Florida and Joan Finney in Kansas, as re reported. Uh, the Republicans have five. 19 remain undecided. Lowell Weicker, as far as we know, is the only independent 
uh, who has won. Here was a, a closely watched contest that we, about which we've heard very little here in Minnesota. A Democrat, Sharon Pratt Dixon, uh, has been elected to succeed the indicted and convicted Marion Berry in Washington, D.C. Uh, she was something of a, we haven't have been in Washington, D.C. at the time Miss Dixon came through. And I'll tell you, the town was agog. She was a surprise winner in a five-way Democratic primary, and she campaigned as an outsider promising to uh, clean up Washington government. And you have to beg the question, of course, what else could she have done? So, so <laughs> far, that's what we have here. Colleen, Don? Okay. I beg. Thank you, Dave. Can you imagine covering a major uh, political event in the state of Minnesota and not having that perspective? No. The Dave Moore perspective? I can't perspective? imagine. We're very fortunate. We'll be back in just a moment. You've just built a new home, the American dream. But for reasons beyond your control, the dream you've built has become a nightmare. This is Al Austin of the WCCO TVI team. How can a home be built so poorly that it might cave in at any time? And why won't the state of Minnesota take action against unscrupulous contractors? Our investigation begins with a trip to one family's tragedy, a house from hell. The American Nightmare, a special I-Team report beginning Wednesday night at 10 on Channel 4. Money, money, money. Where does it all go? Especially these days. And where are you going to turn? Try turning to WCCO-TV for Money Watch. It's a series of reports and tips on ways you can be wiser with your funds during these tough economic times. Information on everything from investment opportunities to saving cash at the gas pump. Watch weeknights during the 5 and 10 o'clock news, plus Money Watch updates at 6.55. Money Watch, exclusively on Channel 4. For busy families on the go, making healthy food choices and getting regular exercise isn't always easy. Or is it? Hi, I'm Ann Schieber. Throughout November, WCCO-TV will show you how you and your family can take 20 steps to a better diet for life through the eyes of the Thompson family of Crystal. Each week in the 5 o'clock news, we'll monitor their progress. Plus, we'll also provide daily menus and health tips. To receive a free Diet for Life booklet, call 330-9009. Help support Minneapolis Children's Medical Center and join WCCO-TV for our third annual A Red Ribbon Affair. Hi, I'm Don Shelby. And I'm Mark Rosen. Invest in the special needs of children while enjoying an evening of gourmet food, live entertainment, and much more at the conservatory. Participating stores will donate 10% of all purchases made that day to Minneapolis Children's Medical Center. A Red Ribbon Affair, Thursday, November 29th. For ticket information, call 863-6621. Welcome back to Election 90, where we are hoping to be receiving some results soon this evening. It could be a few hours, though, before we see anything definite. We have been getting some information or some sense from some of the campaigns. Basically, all we're really getting, those. everybody's nervous, and it's very right. close. And, and the technology, of course, of elections has changed over the years, so now relying more heavily on the presumptions that are supplied by exit polls as opposed to the actual hard figures that have come across. But one of the uh, things that uh, has changed since 1989 when the law went on the ballot that uh, when schools need to increase revenue for the operations of their schools, they have to put it on uh, the ballot and it has to be put before the voters as referenda. And Daryl Savage is in our election desk because I think we have 53 or so school districts out of the 434 in the state that uh, will be asking for money uh, on this election day. How did it go? Well, that's correct, Don. As you say, one out of every eight Minnesota school districts are asking for money from the taxpayers. At this point, we're waiting to hear if those referenda have done well. Uh, referenda on the ballot again for 53 different districts asking for a total of $81 million. A lot of those districts say that that money is crucial. Now, we put together a story today looking at some of the major issues. I can't focus the time because I can't see what I'm doing. Tonight, the state schools will learn the biggest lesson of the year, finding out how much taxpayers are willing to pay for either reforming or, in some cases, maintaining programs in the schools. Minnesota's three largest districts, Minneapolis, Anoka, Hennepin, and St. Paul, all have referenda on the ballot, as well as Bloomington, Hopkins, Rosemont, Apple Valley, and St. Cloud, just to name a few. Okay, if there are no questions, uh, you may begin. Many of the districts have received support from businesses in their area. Some businesses have remained neutral, and others, most notably in Minneapolis, have come out against the referendum. 
In most areas, the school referenda have taken a back seat to the hotly contested gubernatorial and Senate races. But many of the districts say tonight's results will have life or death implications for their districts. Much of the referendum money proposed across the state would be to fund early childhood or at-risk education programs. Some money would go to hiring teachers or specialists or to reduce class size. But the great majority of districts claim they need the money just to maintain the current programs. Donna Colleen, many of the representatives from the school districts say they are very concerned. Concerned that taxpayers feel like they're being pushed to the limit and they will not be voting in favor. Donna Colleen. All right. Well, thank you, Darrell. We're going to go right now out to DFL headquarters where Amy Marcellus is standing by. Amy, can you tell us what's happening there? Well, what's happening is the Wellstones have just walked in. There's quite a crowd surrounding them. How are you both feeling at this point with the exit polls looking good for you at this time? Well, I think Sheila can speak for herself. I mean, I, I feel good. Um, I want to wait, you know, to see those votes actually come in. And uh, I'm not going to take anything for granted, but it sounds good. And I'm, you know, we're, we're real pleased, but we're going we're gonna to wait. I asked someone with your campaign what he felt was the turning point in your campaign. What, what can you really point to as, as being that special time when things really turned around for you? Well, again, we've got to wait to see what these final returns are. I mean, I, for us, I think it was two things. I, I never had this money. Uh, you know, this last week probably uh, more was spent in the other campaign than we had all together. And uh, it was a matter of whether or not people would go for a lot of the, you know, negative ads. And I don't think people did. And the other thing is turnout. We just had people that were helping us so much. And uh, we don't. We have to wait till the returns are in and then we'll know for sure. Uh, I feel good. I, I, I think we're going to win this race. It'll, it'll, and if we do, I owe it to all the people that helped me. What about the letter, the Boschwitz letter? Do you think that really turned things around, that a lot of people I, in the Jewish community voted in support of you instead of him, that I, that was a very I, divisive I, issue? I, do, I just don't know. I, don't know. I, I really don't know. It hurt him, though. Don't you think it definitely it hurt him. Uh, so? I don't think it was good, but it's hard for me to gauge it. Thank you very much. That's it from here for now. We'll talk to you uh, a little later on this evening. All right, thank you, Amy. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Very Amy. Good. From WCCO Television News, this is special coverage of Election 90. roughly 26 percent. Now it looks like it's hovering around 65 percent. And I think that's wonderful. It speaks well for the restoration of dignity in Minnesota politics. It speaks well for the fact that the people do want to participate in campaigns that deeply care about public policy issues. So we'll wait through the night. I think it's going to go well. There's a lot of refreshments here. The band is absolutely marvelous. Keep playing that Rocky Balboa theme and we'll win, I'll guarantee you. Thank you. Artie Carlson and Jamel Durstad making an appearance at our headquarters, our, our reporters uh, at Carlson headquarters, rather, where Bill Hudson is standing by. Uh, speaking, Bill, uh, apparently on how pleased he was with the voter turnout. It's exactly, that... exactly, Don. He's extremely pleased with voter turnout. He said, uh, you know, when they entered this race just 15 days ago, predictions were that there was only going to be about a 25% voter turnout. However, in the last two weeks, he's been able to excite the electorate, and uh, he feels that it's uh, largely uh, uh, his candidacy that's brought a lot of people out to the polls, that they have really had a choice between his politics and the politics of uh, Governor Rudy Perpich. So, Arnie Carlson is very upbeat. He thinks that, uh, according to what they're seeing, the numbers that uh, they aren't doing their own exit polling, but the numbers that they're hearing from those who are, it, uh, it looks very good tonight, Don. All right, thank you very much. You Bill bet. Hudson standing by at Carlson headquarters. That's the first appearance that we've seen of Carlson tonight. He had been eating with his uh, family alone in private part of uh, the area there. And uh, that's the two candidates we've seen now. We have seen uh, Mr. Wellstone and we've seen Carlson, but uh, we have not seen uh, the governor, nor have we seen Mr. Boschwitz of those two important races. We, we have seen the two candidates that uh, appear to be 
doing okay based just on exit polling information of course not one single vote has been uh, uh, tabulated or at least officially tabulated yet this is just the sense that some of the uh, candidates and some of the uh, network exit polling is giving us but we this may be the challengers night this may be one of the reasons that they feel uh, comfortable coming out in the light of day right now and one way to get some of the information is to go to Alan Cox who has been keeping track of some of that information coming from the exit polls Alan what can you tell us Colleen the exit poll isn't telling us who's winning the governor's race or the Senate race in Minnesota. So far, still too close to call. But one message coming through loud and clear, voters are saying that they're uh, tired of incumbents. When you ask them which they prefer to do, by a two-to-one margin, the voters are saying they'd rather see some new faces in office rather than uh, re-electing the incumbents. Now, you have to take that with a grain of salt because that's what voters are saying nationwide. But as Dan Rather has been reporting, when voters get into the election booth and have a choice between two names, they're still overwhelmingly voting for the incumbent. We'll have to see how it turns out in Minnesota. Some of the voters we spoke with said they were ready to make a switch and they voted that way. Shape. Our federal government's in terrible shape. We need some new people in there that aren't going to go, that see what we need and, and to change things. It's time to give a chance to newcomers with new ideas. And uh, I think the state needs a turnover and new politicians. Oh, I think Purpose done a pretty good job all the years he's been in there. And, and I don't know, Boschwitz is getting too cocky. I, I don't like him. Time to get some new ones. Why that? Oh, they don't seem to have done what they promised. Pat Kessler, the uh, voters say they're going to get rid of incumbents, but we're going to have to wait a little while longer to see whether they're uh, telling us the truth. Yeah, we're going to have to wait to see, and uh, we'll believe it when we do see it. As you mentioned, Ellen, around the country, that's not exactly happening. But uh, from the looks of the faces of the people we interviewed, they look like they mean what they say. Uh, why is it, though, I wonder, uh, I'd like to go to Steve Shear, our political analyst, and ask, why is it that the voters here appear ready to take some of these incumbents to the woodshed? Well, I think that uh, whenever you're in office for a long period of time, you gradually develop a list of enemies that grows over time. The question is whether that list will grow quickly or slowly, and for some uh, incumbents tonight, it may have grown too quickly. Is it simply enemies? Is that the right word here? Well, I think people uh, become exposed to you, and, and uh, if there are uh, quirks or shortcomings or policy differences, they become more evident uh, for an incumbent than for a challenger. A challenger has the opportunity to package him or herself uh, much more freely than an incumbent does, and uh, that gives you strategic flexibility in a campaign. Once again, people say one thing, but they apparently are doing another. Uh, how, how does that figure here? Well, again, you have to think about general attitudes that people have and attitudes they have about particular candidates and particular races. Those are two different ways of thinking, and you can't always assume a link between the general attitude and an attitude about a specific candidate. Even if voters were not tired of the candidates before the governor's race began in earnest uh, or the Senate race a month ago, do you think that had an influence? Well, uh, I think the last two months have produced uh, some interest. As I said, it's sort of the interest that you get from uh, from uh, perhaps mud wrestling or uh, roller derby. It's, it's not exactly a savory interest in all respects. Uh, but I have a feeling people have picked favorites out of this tumult, and I think we're seeing who the favorites are tonight. Well, I think a lot of people do like uh, mud wrestling and roller derby, so, <laughs> you know. Uh, well, thanks very much, Steve. We appreciate it. Now, uh, Mike Walsher, uh, we understand, uh, standing by to talk to us. Mike, what have you got? Well, Pat, uh, Marlene Johnson has arrived here at the Holiday Inn uh, in downtown Minneapolis, the DFL headquarters. She arrived a few moments ago, went to a private area of the hotel out of the sight of media cameras, made no comment on the governor's chances. Preparatist people were down here a few moments ago. They circulated briefly. They said, don't count our man out yet, and then went back upstairs also to their private suites. With me, though, is Dan Gustafson of the AFL-CIO, long active in DFL politics. Dan, what are your concerns about the governor's chances? Well, Mike, we're concerned because nationwide it seems that the only ones that have been in trouble are governors. Doesn't look like there's been much changes in the Senate or in the House, but there are some upsets throughout the country and governors. It seems that the public is somehow zeroing in on, on some of the governor races. Uh, this may be the first time in a long time that uh, we're looking at uh, whatever's going to come out of these uh, absentee ballots. It looks like it's going to be a kind of a close one all evening. I wanted to bring that up. There are a lot of absentee ballots out. I understand a record number. Do you think that could uh, bring victory? Well, obviously, it all depends on uh, who it was that voted. Some of these ballots are two, three weeks old, you know. Uh, some have been a month or so old. So you never know how many ballots have got uh, various people's names on them. 
All right, very good. Thank you, Dan. That's the situation from here. Back to you, uh, Donna Colleen or Pat. Okay, thank you, Mike. Well, to get an idea of just how uh, voter turnout was, it expected to be much higher than originally uh, forecasted. We're going to go now to Caroline Lowe, who is standing by the Secretary of State's office with the Secretary of State. Well, Colleen and Don, we just got the first results in, just a few precincts, I believe, in the southern part of the state. With me is Secretary of State Joan Groh. Can you tell us what information we have at this point? Well, it, this is the point uh, in the evening for us when we breathe a sigh of relief because the computer's working. We've gotten our first returns in about nine precincts, and then from the southern part of the state, Jackson County was the first county to report in, and they were the first one in the primary, so they'll be pleased. Anything conclusive from the area? No, not with nine precincts doesn't tell you much, but the race, both for U.S. Senate and for governor, looked very close just with those precincts reporting. How, when do you usually find out the results statewide, and how long do you think it'll take this evening with yeah. the extra ballot? We usually have enough results to get a general idea, at least we did in the primary, about 9, 9.30 in the evening, maybe 10 o'clock. But tonight, I think with the large turnout that we're anticipating, the fact that people had an additional paper ballot to count, I would not be surprised if it'll be 11 or 11.30 at night before we hear. Any problems throughout the state with the changes this year? Have you had any difficulties? There really weren't. I think it took longer in the polling place because judges were explaining to voters that this is your supplemental ballot and this is why the race is crossed off on your regular ballot. I think it took voters a little bit longer to perhaps validate those ballots. It's going to take a lot longer to count. We're estimating at least an hour, possibly two hours in some precincts. But the voting seemed to go smoothly and voters were happy to stand in line or at least they didn't complain too much. How many people actually voted today? What kind of projections did you finally come up with? Well, I don't know how many people voted. Last Thursday we had projected that 49 percent of the people would vote. And as we talked to local election administrators today, they thought we were going to be low, which it would be fine with us. We're always happy to go the other way. But the metropolitan area, the suburban area, basically thought that they were going to get about 50 percent. And of course, we know up on the Iron Range that it's often 70, 75 percent turnout. So we'll really perhaps have a better indication of that later in the evening. Okay, thank you very much. We'll, we'll be standing by throughout the evening, probably early in the morning. We'll get back to you as soon as we have any conclusive results. Don and Colleen. Okay, thank you, Caroline. Thank you. Well, we've just received word, and as Caroline told us, a few, well, a few results were coming in. We don't have from them Jackson just County. Yet. I think some uh, of the original uh, figures were coming in there, but only a few precincts. Not really enough to make any any uh, firm estimates on. And uh, the governor's race does have some some figures being reported now. Well, this is with just two percent of the precincts in uh, statewide. Uh, Rudy Perpich, Marlene Johnson, it, with the votes that are tabulated so far, leading with 53 percent of the vote. That's about 4,000 votes to Arnie Carlson and Janelle Deerstad's 3,600. That, of course, is just the very, very first votes coming in. And uh, at this point of the night, they really don't tell us a lot. Joan Groh in a race herself uh, with David Jennings. Now, that's not the David Jennings. That's uh, the David Jennings that uh, had led the Republican Party and, uh, in fact, had been an erstwhile candidate for governor at one point. Uh, in the race for Secretary of State, Joan Grove, 61 percent over David Jennings, uh, independent Republican candidate for Secretary of State at 37 percent. Hubert Humphrey III, Skip Humphrey, uh, trying to retain his uh, seat as the Attorney General against Kevin Johnson, uh, an assistant county attorney for Hennepin County, a prosecutor in the criminal division, 64% to 36%. And Michael McGrath over John Berger, 56% to 43%. And Mark Dayton in a race against Bob Heinrich for Arnie Carlson's old seat as state auditor. Mark Dayton, DFL, 60%. Heinrich, 40%. But you can see zero precincts reporting. That means uh, only a few uh, votes are being reported in even incomplete figures coming in from one precinct out of uh, Jackson County. Now in the race for the U.S. Senate with 2% 2 2 of the precincts reporting, those votes tabulated so far, Rudy Boschwitz leading with 52% of the vote to 48% of Paul Wellstone's. And basically what we're seeing both in the race for U.S. Senate and the governor's race, that at this point is just uh, really impossible to tell anything from those numbers so far. Very, very close, as the exit polls have been indicating as well. We had one national race we wanted to tell you about because CBS, based on exit polling in North Carolina, has just called the race between uh, incumbent Senator Jesse Helms and the Democratic challenger Harvey Gantt. 
Uh, that was the first attempt by a black Senate candidate since Reconstruction to try to hold a Senate position from a southern state uh, since the, uh, shortly after the Civil War. Uh, but Jesse Helms declared by CBS the winner will be returned to the Senate, uh, a veteran senator there, over Harvey Gantt. But certainly not the last we'll hear from Harvey Gantt. Okay, let's take a look back at uh, what's happening here in Minnesota. We're going to go to Cindy Hilger, who's out at IR headquarters in Bloomington. Cindy. Well, Colleen and Don, we are still waiting to see an appearance by Senator Rudy Boschwitz. We are told he is in the hotel. He is quietly in a room watching the returns. Right now, standing by with me, however, is Bob Weinholzer. He is the chairman of the State Independent Republican Party. And, Bob, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, as we've seen, these exit polls indicate that in the race for U.S. Senate, this race is too tight to call. It's a cliffhanger. Is this something you expected, given the, the poll results we saw over the weekend that showed Senator Boschwitz nine points ahead? I thought so, because I had been saying for the last week that I thought the turnout would be 58 percent. Apparently, it's going to even be higher. And with the higher turnout, it definitely favored Arnie Carlson to win. But the higher the turnout, the less it favored Rudy Boschwitz. So with the high turnout, I think uh, what you're seeing is it's going to take a lot longer for Rudy to actually win it. Now, why would a high turnout not favor Senator Boschwitz? Well, when you have a high turnout, uh, if it's a high turnout and it's coming out, there are a few more Democrats in the state than there are Republicans. So you have a higher turnout, you tend to have more Democrats coming out. What about the spending issue? We were told that Senator Boschwitz outspent Paul Wellstone by a ratio of about six to one. Um, wouldn't that lead you to believe that perhaps that would give him a definite edge over, over Paul Wellstone? Well, I, I think the amount of money that's spent is, is uh, the power of it is overestimated. I don't think it's that important. People still, when all the hoopla is over, they look and they, they see who they think would make a better senator, and they decide on that rather than these 15 and 30 second bites that you see on television all the time. We just saw a little bit of um, Arnie Carlson over at his, his headquarters at the Greenway in downtown Minneapolis. He seemed very upbeat. Um, any, any predictions for that race? Well, I think with the turnout, I think Arnie will win. I, I definitely do. I think I've been saying if there's a big turnout, he's a sure winner. How important is it for Arnie Carlson to come over here tonight and try to mend some fences and bring this party back together? Oh, he will. The only reason we're in two separate places is they had already committed to their place and we'd already committed to ours. But we have two shuttle buses running back and forth between the two headquarters. So he'll be here tonight, and very shortly I'm going to be leaving to go over there. Quickly, what kind of reception will he get here? Oh, I think a good one. I mean, you know, if you're, you're never, you never yell at a winner. You're always happy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very good. It's the, uh, the, the biggest smile I've seen on the face here so far this evening. Don and Clean, we're going to go back to you. Bob, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Cindy. <laughs> Don, you just received some uh, results information. Why? Yes. And uh, the neighbor state, Republican Governor Tommy Thompson, apparently has just been reelected in uh, the state of Wisconsin. And uh, those people who have been following uh, the career of Bill Bradley, uh, from the former president, Princeton great New York Nick basketball player and some people touted as uh, perhaps a future presidential candidate has been locked in a much tighter race than anyone had ever expected. A woman who had not spent very much money uh, has apparently uh, picked up on some anti-democratic feeling going on in uh, that state and it looks like he will keep his seat by but just one percentage point if that much. So that is uh, still too close to call but they are saying it appears Bradley will maintain his seat in New Jersey. And to help us kind of make sense of all of this, Pat Kessler is joining us now to uh, kind of give us his uh, <laughs> assessment of what's happening well, here. Well, I can't wait H1. to see some of these actual votes. I mean, I we've been talking about uh, exit polls for the last hour, and, and, and I want to see some actual votes. But it was interesting to watch the one county uh, returns we saw, the Jackson County, Minnesota, south southwestern Minnesota, which is heavy Republican territory. And Paul Wellstone was doing surprisingly well against uh, Rudy Boschwitz there. But again, uh, the votes are just not here yet. Uh, a lot of it is being hand counted. It's going to be some time. It, it, we do know, however, that uh, there is some of the anti-incumbent feeling out there. Uh, we don't know how severe it will be for the incumbents in Minnesota, but we know it is there. I think particularly we see that in the uh, race in New Jersey for the, uh, the Senate race. There was kind of this, uh, uh, he, he's kind of taking the brunt of what the governor had been doing there in, in raising taxes, and a lot of people were blaming the U.S. Senator for that, who happened to be a Democrat. I think it's well. a fair question to uh, put to Pat, uh, and uh, perhaps you want to talk to uh, Steve a little bit about this as well, but uh, how much can we blame, or how much can Rudy Boschwitz blame uh, the position he finds himself in tonight on John Grunseth? Well, it was, it was very interesting because it was a convergence of perhaps bad luck. Uh, some of it was uh, of Boschwitz's own doing, uh, perhaps. But they agree that about three weeks ago, when the budget crisis blew up in Washington, Senator Boschwitz was there, and uh, it, it affected his race, and they acknowledged that. And uh, as well, the, the Grunseth 
uh, factor was something that, in fact, did have some effect. Our polls showed that at least 10% uh, of the people we questioned said that it would have an effect and they would not vote Republican. So the question now is, uh, does John Grunseth owe Boschwitz an apology if this race is indeed very close and if indeed uh, uh, Boschwitz loses this race? And, and regardless of how it all turns out, will we ever really know the answer to that question? No, of course to... not. Okay. It's fun to speculate on okay. election night, that's all. <laughs> all right. All right, thanks, Pat. Well, we'll be talking to you a lot throughout the evening. Yeah. Yeah, we might even have some numbers to talk right. about yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. Since we're talking about John Grunseth, it is obvious that uh, his absence in this election can be noted. Until nine days ago, he was the candidate endorsed by the Independent Republican Party, but stories about nude swimming and a longtime uh, mistress and affair helped him decide to drop out. Now Grunseth is in Hawaii, and WCCO-TV was able to talk to him about this election day just last night. Here's reporter Steve Eckert with this exclusive report. I normally don't dream. I dream about this every night. It's a haunting kind of thing. You think about it uh, constantly. John Grunseth, tonight was to have been the triumphant end of his two-year campaign for governor. Instead, Grunseth and his wife Vicki are spending it here at a secluded oceanfront resort in Hawaii, taking stock nine days after withdrawing from the campaign. They agreed to talk with us about the governor's race that passed them by. Uh, I'm ambivalent about who wins the election. Uh, I think it's a Tweedledum, Tweedledee kind of situation. Uh, I regard both Perpich and Carlson as long-term incumbents uh, who really have not a lot to offer. After a week of reflection here in Hawaii, John Grunseth continues to deny the allegations of sexual impropriety continues to claim that he was unfairly hounded from the governor's race. But there's something new. Now, John Grunseth says he is haunted by the suspicion that somehow Arne Carlson's campaign may have been secretly involved in leveling the allegations against him. Do you suspect that? Uh, very strongly so. Uh, very much so. Uh, but I think that's a subject for another story at another time. Grunseth gave no specifics, no evidence to support his suspicions. But he vowed that no matter who wins the election, four years from now, he'll be leading a challenge to unseat him. And does that mean Grunseth would consider running again himself? I've uh, grown very, very fond of, of saying never say never. Uh, but uh, based on I this... I can say never. <laughs> never. But based on this experience, I would say it's very, very unlikely. Uh, but John Grunseth says one thing is as certain as the sunrise. He says he intends to fight back in an attempt to restore his battered reputation. With Gary Feblowitz, Steve Eckert, WCCO Television News, Wialaha Village, Hawaii. Tweedledee and Tweedledum. That is how uh, John Grunseth now, to today, in Hawaii, characterizes Arne Carlson and Rudy Perpich. Well, certainly uh, nothing like tossing a hand grenade in the middle of a governor's race, my goodness, uh, uh, alleging here that he believes that Arne Carlson uh, was secretly behind some of the allegations against him. Uh, Arne Carlson has denied that in the past. Uh, we've never heard him say that publicly, however. And where would Does this it be mean the that he's, uh, he's taken it back, that he thinks uh, Governor Rudy Perpich was somehow behind this, or that they were in cahoots together? Well, the, I think he does believe that uh, over time, over the last, last couple of weeks of the campaign, that uh, there were circumstances, circumstantial evidence uh, in any case, that linked uh, the DFL, and he believed linked Rudy Perpich to this. This is the first we've heard about the uh, Arne Carlson link that he alleges. It would be well. tough to uh, implicate D. Long, a uh, long-time DFL uh, uh, candidate, worker, uh, office holder, and uh, Bob Tennyson, former senator and uh, attorney at law, who he had implicated as being part of the of the Perpich connection as being uh, somehow lackeys of Arne Carlson. Well, I don't think it's tough at all. I, I think that's the circumstantial evidence he talks about. I, I, I think that uh, he tries to make that case, and that's exactly what he does believe. Uh, I think uh, we heard a declaration of war here tonight as well. John Grunseth says that uh, either Arne Carlson or Rudy Perpich, no good. He's going to go after him. Very Sounds surprising stuff. Very bitter. Very sad. Very, very bitter. We're going to go right now to Alan Cox, who has some information, some uh, light to shed on this subject. Alan? Uh, Colleen, if John Grunseth does decide to run in four years, he has his work cut out for him. One of the questions asked today in our exit poll was, if it had been a three-way race, if John Grunseth had stayed in the race, 
how would you have voted? And, of course, uh, the uh, result uh, depends on which voters it turned out. Maybe if John Grunseth had stayed in the race, some voters who stayed home today might have turned out. But as you can see from our results, he would have run a very poor third uh, in the results. Uh, it still would have been a, a very close contest between Rudy Perpich and Arnie Carlson. The margin of sampling error in our poll at this point is plus or minus four percentage points. But John Grunseth uh, has a, a long way to go before he uh, builds his way back into a statewide candidacy. All righty. Thank you, Alan. Well, the information getting from Alan is that uh, uh, Grunseth would have his work cut out for him if he yes. should decide to run, or had he stayed in the race this time. Well, John Grunseth uh, became an accomplished politician. He was a master organizer. He uh, did an awful lot. He got very, very far in this governor's race. Perhaps he didn't see the handwriting on the wall soon enough. Uh, Steve Shear, come on into this discussion. Tell us uh, what you think about this. Uh, did he get out soon enough? Is it going to affect the election? What do you think? Oh, his absence has a big effect, I think, on, uh, on Rudy Boschwitz's prospects tonight. I think that you lost a huge phone bank that could uh, uh, call hundreds of thousands of Republican stalwarts and make much more likely uh, their turnout uh, at the polling place. And I think that, that the Boschwitz people are probably missing that tonight. And I think Rudy Boschwitz is, uh, is sorry that that's not here. There's bitterness with the John Grunseth uh, and the allegations, bitterness against Carlson, bitterness against uh, Purpose. Do you think there's bitterness against the Boschwitz people? Um, I think there's bitterness. There's still residual bitterness by many Grunseth supporters uh, about uh, Boschwitz's role in trying to gradually ease him out of the out of the uh, can out of his exactly. Candidacy. He entered the race, injected himself yeah. in this race. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, I th as we know, about uh, 10 days ago, there seemed to be a white-hot rage on the part of Grunseth partisans to, uh, to uh, uh, actually go after uh, uh, Rudy Boschwitz. And there may be some of that still lingering tonight. And in a very close race, any one of these factors can determine the outcome. So it's really not that hard to understand how John Grunseth feels tonight, is it? No, I think uh, that he is a, a bitter person. And uh, a bitterness deserve, uh, breeds a certain amount of suspicion. But, but Steve... Uh, does he deserve to be bitter? Does he deserve to be sad? I mean, this, this is a man who's been through all this. Well, I think that, uh, uh, I think that running as he did, uh, he had to be aware that his personal life would eventually become an issue. If he did not think that it would become an issue in the way it did, then I don't think he carefully appraised his own prospects for the governorship. Well, there's some cold, hard facts. Uh, he's 3,000 miles away. It's, it must be a bittersweet night for him. Oh, extremely. And I'm certain it's going to be uh, many, many days before he can put this behind him to any significant extent. Okay, Steve, thanks so much. Don, Colleen. Pat, stay with us because we've got some, uh, apparently some figures coming in now on the governor's race we want to take a look at. And uh, uh, we show here with four precincts reporting, so you see the numbers are building slowly. We've got 19,000 uh, votes in already. Rudy Perpich, Marlene Johnson, 54% over Arnie Carlson and Joe Nelderstad. Now, I, I meant to say 4%. I don't know what I did say, but I, I meant to say 4%. 54%, 46 with uh, Rudy Perpich over Arnie Carlson at this moment. Uh, we're going to have some more returns coming in as the evening goes on. We're going to continue to talk about these issues, uh, including the most recent revelations, which uh, we just uh, showed you exclusively here on WCCO-TV. That is John Grunseth uh, saying that he has uh, plans four years from now, not necessarily meaning John Grunseth in a race for governor, but to do something about unseating either Tweedledee or Tweedledum uh, to use his uh, own characterization of Arnie Carlson and Rudy Perpich in this race. All right. Um, I, I believe now we're going to be taking a break. Please stay with us, and we'll be back with more election results as they come in. Tension is mounting in the Middle East. You need to know what's going on, and you need to know now. So tune to the news leader, WCCO Radio 830. WCCO Radio and the CBS Radio Network bring you the events as they unfold as well as compelling interviews with the experts. For news as it happens in the Middle East, turn to the radio station you trust. WCCO Radio, 830. She's got it. That's my job. I know how to do it. He's got it. His eyes, his lips, and uh, the way he walks. There's a cute butt. Cute butt. They got it. I think sex appeal is your charm, it's your personality. It's your charm and all that, but really, the dress don't hurt at all. The sexiest celebrities on the next Oprah Winfrey Show.
Wednesday at 4 on Channel 4. An exclusive interview with Gwensith and Maui, tonight at 10 on Channel 4. Welcome back to our coverage of Election 90. Right now we have some information on the U.S. Senate race, and we're going to go to Ellen Cox for that. Colleen, uh, the race remains too close to call based on the exit poll taken today by voter research and surveys. That's cooperative of CBS News, ABC, NBC, and CNN. But we can show you how the voters came down on certain issues and why it's uh, making for a close race between Rudy Boschwitz and uh, Paul Wellstone. Paul Wellstone's getting his strength today among uh, young voters, those uh, under the age of 35. He's uh, leading by a two-to-one margin, leading among uh, members of labor unions, leading among people who are worried about the direction of the national economy, and leading strongly among voters who describe themselves as liberal. Rudy Boschwitz is finding his strength among middle-aged voters, among voters who say that the country is all in all going in the right direction, and a very strong vote among those who say they are conservative. On the top issues in the race, education, voters are breaking two to one in favor of Wellstone. On the environment, two to one in favor of Wellstone. On the national economy, uh, narrowly uh, in favor of Rudy Boschwitz. On uh, who will do the best job in terms of federal taxes, narrowly in favor of Rudy Boschwitz. And on the issue of abortion, about a two to one advantage for Boschwitz. What it all adds up to, the race is too close at that, this point. We'll just have to wait for some more precincts to be reported. Colleen, Don. All right, Alan, we do have some hard figures coming in on the Senate race. We'd like to take a look at those as they uh, put them up for us. The Senate race, um, you have to understand, though, we don't have lots and lots and lots of numbers. We have about uh, 23,000 uh, votes in right now with 4% of the precincts reporting. But it does show Rudy Boschwitz with a very, very narrow margin, uh, even with these low figures coming in, uh, over Paul Wellstone. But okay, the exit polls seem to show that that's going to start to adjust uh, one way or another as time goes on throughout the night. Okay, and now we're going to go switch gears and go out to DFL headquarters where Mike Walsher is standing by. Right, Colleen, and the Wellstone supporters have been very excited every time some numbers come up on the screen. And another person who's been smiling in the last few minutes is Lieutenant Governor Marlene Johnson at the numbers you're seeing. Well, it uh, feels really good. I started the morning talking to our phone bank coordinators, and they had volunteers lined up all day. and. I spent the last couple hours traveling around to the several districts, and people are calling people at 4 in the afternoon who've already voted, and those are our lists, our supporters. The turnout reflects a very high turnout in the districts where we feel we're really strong, so we're very encouraged. And from my standpoint, I, I would say that the adults look like they're voting for kids. <laughs> All right. Now, what, what is your prediction? What kind of margin do you think you'll oh, win? I, I don't know. It's too early to predict a margin. I'm not really interested in margins anyway. All I'm concerned about is that 50% plus one. But I feel very strong that we've made a case to the public that uh, the DFL ticket, the Purpose Johnson ticket, and the Wellstone team uh, are the ticket for kids, and that the adults of Minnesota recognize that if we want to put children first, that they've made their right choice today. There's been a lot of talk about an anti-governor feeling around the nation, an anti-incumbent feeling. Well, I haven't heard much about that at all for a number of weeks now. I think that we've been out together as a team for the last four days, and we've been talking to lots and lots of people from the farmer's market here in Minneapolis to the bus stops to the Iron Range, and the, the feeling has been very strong for the governor, for Paul Wellstone, and we're feeling very confident tonight, and clearly the turnout reflects that people are excited and enthused about politics, even though the pollsters and people have been saying people are turned off. Clearly the turnout here says people aren't turned off, they're excited to participate. Right, and many people are saying Wellstone's effort had a lot to do with that. If you win, do you believe it's because you had Wellstone on the ticket? Well, I think we've been a good team. We've been a very good team. We've worked together very closely. We've coordinated our campaigns, and I think working together is what the DFL ticket is all about. All right, thank you, Marlene. Back to you, Donna Clayton. All right, thank you, Mike. Thanks, well, Mike. Marlene Johnson, certainly the most upbeat candidate we've heard from so far. Everybody else is just kind of standing back a little and uh, afraid to say too much before they see more numbers. And, and she's been upbeat throughout this entire process. Uh, we haven't seen a great deal of Marlene Johnson throughout this, uh, you might call it the mud wallowing that occurred in the governor's race. She somehow uh, stayed up uh, on the high ground throughout it all. And uh, I think she uh, probably reads people uh, 
uh, in a positive way when she sees them. In fact, her, her statement that she sees the adults voting for the kids, meaning the children's programs that both the governor and Paul Wellstone stand for in this case. I'm going to go to Alan Cox because behind these exit polls, not only just the numbers of who did you vote for and, and why, uh, but uh, some of the other reasons that go into this, uh, this model and talk about some of those. Why are people making these decisions? Well, uh, Don, we can give you some idea of that coalition that Marlene Johnson was talking about that the DFL has put together tonight. This is basically a DFL state, but for right now, it's a state that's too close to call in the two major races. And uh, we're being told by the uh, analysts in New York that it may stay too close to call for quite a while. The supporters of Rudy Perpich include who you would expect, DFL voters today uh, by a wide margin, people who uh, uh, are opponents of abortion voting strongly for Perpich. Catholics voting for Perpich, and people who consider themselves liberals voting for Rudy Perpich, though not by a, a very wide margin. For Arne Carlson, a very strong vote among women. There's a real gender gap here. Among men, uh, it's a split about 50 to 50 in the uh, results of the exit poll that we have right now. But coming down very strongly for Carlson among women, we'll be waiting for some updated figures that we should have in just a few minutes. Arne Carlson also doing well among upper income groups, among people who call themselves Republicans, and people who call themselves independents. Once again, good news for Arne Carlson, because uh, the election is always is won in the middle. Uh, the independents, the swing votes, the ones who could swing the election. And uh, Arne Carlson doing well with people who support the right to abortion. Uh, once again, uh, we're still waiting for a few more precincts to come in, and we should have some updated information on the hows and whys of the way Minnesota voters acted today. Don, Colleen. Okay, thank Thanks, you, Alan. Ellen. Well, we have been told that we have some new uh, numbers to show you in the U.S. Senate race. If we can take a look at that, we will share that information with you. Now, with 5% of the precincts reporting from around the state, it's dead even between Rudy Boschwitz and Paul Wellstone. Rudy Boschwitz leading with about 200 some votes um, but so far with the votes that have been tabulated it is even in that race in the US Senate which is one of the reasons why they're telling us from the uh, national election headquarters it's uh, just altogether too close to absolutely call. obvious on its face now what we'll also be able to do just a little bit later on is tell you from what parts of the state these votes are coming and that will give the analysts a little better opportunity to tell us uh, whether those are strongholds for the uh, uh, the Republicans or Democrats. And, and if, for instance, this is a stronghold for one or the other and the votes are coming in even, that could predict a trend. And sure. we'll be able to tell you more about that as we get more votes down. Uh, Cindy Hilger is standing by at the Independent Republican headquarters. And uh, we'd like to go to her for the reaction that she's finding out there. Well, Don, we are preparing, I, would, I understand, to, for an appearance by Senator Boschwitz. He has just been in the hallways here at the Thunderbird Motel, and he is making his way into the, um, into the main auditorium here. With me, however, right now is his campaign director, Tom Mason. Tom, can you tell me what we are going to be hearing from the senator and uh, what exactly he has to say to all these people that have come out here tonight? Well, no, he has, he is, uh, he's got a, uh, some remarks he wants to make early. He's got a lot of good friends here, a lot of people asking to see him, so he figured it was just a good opportunity to come down and say hi to the folks. Is he pretty upbeat right now? You know, he's Rudy is a guy that can reach down and show tremendous amounts of strength, and he is, he's upbeat. He feels good. We had a good operation, had good turnout, good uh, absentee ballot program. We, uh, we're confident. How do you feel right now? I feel pretty good. I, I, I'm very happy that we decided to embark on a good get out the vote and absentee ballot. We mailed 400,000 absentee ballots. That is going to come around and, and, and help us. So we feel pretty good. So we should be seeing and hearing from him any minute then? I think five, ten minutes. Yeah. All right. Well, and we will be standing by Don and Colleen. And as soon as Senator Boschwitz come on to, comes onto this podium, we will bring you his comments live. Back to you. All right. Thank you, Cindy. We've just been told we have some results coming in from the 7th District up in the northwest quarter of the state in the race for U.S. Congress. Colin Peterson, the challenger, DFL challenger, leading... Uh, with 6% of the precincts reporting, with 61% of the vote so far to the incumbent, uh, I.R. Arlen Stanglin's 39% of the vote. Now, Arlen Stanglin has had many a close race. Actually, this is the third time that Colin Peterson has taken on Arlen Stanglin, and, and the early vote so far shows that he is doing very well up in the 7th District. Stanglin said, uh, uh, and it told the people in Washington, D.C., two different organizations had uh, predicted that this would be one of the weak uh, seats for an incumbent congressman. 
and uh, Stanglin said that this was going to be the toughest race of his career, got into a lot of trouble up there in his neck of the woods based on reports in the St. Cloud newspaper and the St. Paul Pioneer Press saying that he had made some 485 calls on his congressional credit card to a woman back in 87, 88, 86, 87, and 88, and was unable to explain to the satisfaction of everyone there just why he was making all of those phone calls back to Washington to this uh, single woman, and uh, that has haunted him ever since. We're going to have more election results as they come in. Right now, we're going to go back to CBS. We thank you for joining us. Please stay tuned. You fire up the new Eagle Talon, and you've got a power tool that handles like a dream in the corners. Cuts clean across any surface and nails the competition every time. Eagle Talon. The one power tool you won't be so willing to lend to the guy next door. See your great northern Jeep and Eagle dealer where you can expect the best. An exclusive interview with Gwensip and Maui tonight at 10 on Channel 4. Campaign 90, election night continues.